Hello again, everyone. My name is Ryan Rice. I'm the Membership Coordinator here at Freedom of the Press Foundation. Thank you for joining us as we continue our ongoing webinar series on our programs and advocacy efforts surrounding press freedom. Today's session is SecureDrop 101. This recording will be available in FPF's event archives, where you'll find helpful resources on digital security, doxing self-defense, and our advocacy work. Um, this session should last about an hour, and we will include time for Q&A at the end. Um, I do believe the Q&A is open throughout the webinar, though, so if you want to sub submit something as it comes off your head, go right ahead. Um, if you have any questions about this webinar or Freedom of the Press Foundation's work more broadly, feel free to email me at membership at freedom.press. Joining us today is our newsroom support engineer, Nathan Dyer. He will be leading this discussion on SecureDrop, the whistleblowing platform used by journalists around the world. Nathan, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Ryan. I really appreciate it. Hello, everyone. I, I'm glad that you're here for the SecureDrop 101 event with us. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Um, so like Ryan said, uh, if you have any questions, by all means, please be sure to ask. Uh, we're also joined by Kevin O'Gorman, the engineering manager for the SecureDrop team today. So if you have any questions, we'll both be able to field those. Uh, Kevin and Ryan, if you don't mind if any questions do come in through this presentation, if you'll just get my attention, that way I can answer it. Uh, but we'll also have a section at the end for uh, that's dedicated just for those questions. So by all means, please ask if there's anything that, uh, that I don't cover in the presentation or anything that uh, you need some extra clarification on. Uh, so with that, uh, welcome. You've probably heard of SecureDrop before. Uh, it's something that we spend a lot of time uh, working on and thinking about, um, but you might not be aware of exactly what it is or how it's used. So today I want to tell you pretty much everything that you need to know about SecureDrop, and I want to show you exactly how it works. So with that, let's really answer the fundamental question of what is SecureDrop? So at its core, SecureDrop is a tool designed to facilitate whistleblowing. It allows organizations and journalists to receive documents and messages from anonymous sources. The idea being that there are individuals out in the world who have access to knowledge or information that would be in the public interest to be out, um, but they need some help getting it out responsibly uh, and safely. So they need to be able to contact journalists and news organizations to get that out there, um, but they need to do it in a way that preserves their anonymity. So one of the really uh, key differences between SecureDrop versus some of the other tools that exist in the world uh, is that it's really designed to provide protections for high risk sources. So those individuals who would face tremendous personal risk to their safety, well-being, or livelihood should their identity be revealed. And as you may uh, guess, based on the name, SecureDrop is designed to be secure and private. So the messages and documents that are sent uh, are all encrypted. And uh, as we'll talk a little bit more about as we go along, it uses technologies that are meant to preserve source anonymity. Uh, and there are also ways that it protects against third-party access to submissions. It makes sure that the, uh, the only people who can see what you submit are the people that you were intended to get those submissions. Um, they're the only ones that have access to that system. And the key that they need to unlock those submissions and view them lives only on a very special computer within their organization. And then one other thing that I want to highlight here right at the beginning uh, in talking about what SecureDrop is, is the fact that it's open source. And that just means that the code that makes it work, really all the stuff kind of under the hood, is public and verifiable. So if there are security researchers or even you know just uh, people who are interested in SecureDrop, if, if they want to go and actually take a look at the code itself and make sure that it does what we say it does, then that's out there. Anyone can take a look and make sure that it behaves the way it should. And one important aspect of that is something that we do regularly, which is we have our code audited. Uh, we reach out to the security community and we have security professionals uh, come in and take a look at everything and make sure that we're doing our due diligence to keep sources and journalists safe uh, by making sure our code uh, is secure as possible. So that's a little bit about what it is just kind of at the surface. I wanna dig a little bit deeper and talk about why SecureJob? Why would an organization want to install it? Why would sources want to use it? There are numerous reasons. I'm gonna cover several here. Um, there are more, um, but uh, really one of the first problems that it solves is the first contact problem. 
And the first contact problem is this. How can you reach out to a journalist uh, without having contacted them before while remaining anonymous? So if you think about it, if you were to reach out to a journalist via email or with a phone call or even you know, using some of these other uh, encrypted tools and services, when you reach out to them, uh, just by the very act of reaching out, they would learn about your identity, whether it was explicit in the sense of they would uh, you know, see your email address, they might learn your name, uh, or even in ways that aren't so explicit. Uh, you know, If they had uh, ways of, of seeing your IP addresses or your phone numbers or whatever the case may be, it may be possible just by establishing that that first contact um, that your identity could be revealed. SecureDrop solves that problem. It allows sources to reach out to journalists without having ever spoken with them before to establish that first contact in a way that preserves their anonymity. And it does that uh, in a few ways that we'll get into uh, when we actually do the demo in just a few minutes. Uh, another big set of protections that SecureDrop provides is protections against malware. So you've probably been given the advice before if you get an email in your inbox and you're not positive that you know who the, the sender is, um, that if, if there's an attachment that you don't open it because it's inherently dangerous. Uh, and that's really important to note that SecureDrop in many ways is kind of like a public Dropbox. Anyone can come along and submit files or, or send messages. Uh, and receiving random files from strangers on the internet can be really dangerous. So there are a couple ways that SecureDrop mitigates those dangers. And one of the most important is by something called the air gap. So an air gap system is one that isn't connected to the internet uh, or any network. Uh, it never has connected to a network. It never will or can be. In fact, the hardware is physically disabled so that it won't uh, connect to a network. Uh, and that air gap is important uh, because if you were to open uh, you know, a file that you receive, if you were to, de to decrypt it and open it, uh, then uh, there's the potential if there's malware on it that it could phone home to another server uh, or it could even potentially leak your key. So by having everything segmented and only on that one computer, never touching a network, it provides that layer of protection. And then in a similar way, the computer that is used to actually unlock or decrypt those submissions, it has a really special property about it. It uses a special operating system called Tails uh, that is able to revert to a known good state on reboot. So if you were to receive a, a file uh, and when you open it, if it had malware on it, as soon as you powered off the system, that malware would disappear. It would revert to that known good state. So even if you had malware, uh, as soon as you reboot, it's as if it never happened in the first place. So those protections really provide uh, a few layers of, of safety for journalists that are working with these sources or worth working with these submissions that they're receiving essentially from strangers on the internet. And then the other really important uh, protection uh, or property that SecureDrop provides is that there's no third party access. No one else can see the submissions that are sent to a Dropbox, including us. Uh, it's important to note that we have no way of knowing what is sent to a Dropbox. We have, or to a SecureDrop, we have no way of getting any metrics out. We don't know how many users there are. Uh, if someone were to set up a new SecureDrop, we would have no idea. Uh, and it's one of those things, you know, if the leak of the century were to come through a secure drop, then we would have no idea. Uh, one question that we do sometimes get is, do we ever know of a leak that does come from a secure drop? And the answer to that is generally no, we have no way of getting that. Um, there are some exceptions to that. Uh, occasionally, uh, outlets will actually post in their news articles that the information they got came through a secure drop. So whenever that happens, we're able to, to tell, you know, something came through a secure drop. And then there are times when individual journalists will reach out to us through secure channels and just kind of hint to us that, hey, this big story came through a secure drop. Um, but it's always them initiating. We never have any way of automatically knowing. Uh, we have zero access into any of the secure drops. Uh, and then one other, um, really important aspect of that no third party access. It really involves um, the restrictions that we place on uh, how SecureDrop is installed in the environment that it lives in. So when we're working with organizations, uh, we provide a list and this is in our documentation. It's a really kind of strict list of requirements that are needed for a safe SecureDrop environment. The main ones being um, that it needs to be installed on dedicated physical hardware. So 
install it on computers that are actually owned by the news organization and located physically in uh, the news organization's offices uh, on campus. So uh, everything is hosted, uh, everything is installed on actual hardware and lives within the news organization's offices on campus in a secure environment behind lock and key, uh, you know, in an area that has access controls, somewhere safe that is in that newsroom. And by doing so, that provides special legal protections. Like in the United States, there are legal protections that apply to newsrooms uh, that guard, uh, or that really provide special protections in the case of searches and seizures for that server. Even in areas outside of the US or outside of areas that have those special protections for newsrooms, it still has protections against surreptitious ac access elsewhere. Uh, if you were to have someone else uh, install and host your secure drop, uh, it's possible that they would receive uh, a warrant for a search, and it's possible that could come with a gag order to where they couldn't even tell you that happened. You would have no idea that someone was looking through your server or your secure drop. Um, so by actually hosting it on site within the news organization, uh, you know that no one is accessing that server without your knowledge. So that really covers what it is and why you might want to use it. But I want to take some time to talk a bit about how it works. And to do that, I want to refer to this diagram. Now, one thing you'll notice here is that SecureDrop isn't really just one application. It's an ecosystem. It's an entire environment. And I'm going to go through this kind of piece by piece to tell you a little bit about how it works. And the first piece that I want to highlight uh, is this one in the top left corner in the diagram here. This is kind of the heart and soul of Secure Drop. So these are the computers that actually run it. There's one computer whose entire job is to make Secure Drop available. Um, so that's the computer that you connect to if you're a source to submit something. That's what you connect to if you're a journalist, if you want to see what has been submitted. Uh, that's the application computer. Sometimes we call it a server. And there's another computer whose entire job is just to keep an eye on the other one. So making sure that the, the computer that is making SecureDrop available, make sure that it doesn't have any unexpected software packages that are installed, no users accessing it that shouldn't be, uh, making sure that there's no outdated software on it so that it's always running the latest patches so that it's as secure as possible. Uh, if the monitor notices that something's a little bit off, it will create an encrypted email and send it over to the administrator so the administrator can step in immediately and fix whatever's going on. And then it's also important to highlight in between those two computers and the outside world or the internet at large is uh, something, it's a dedicated firewall. That's kind of like a gatekeeper. So it stands between those computers and the network. Um, and it makes sure that only the minimum uh, kind of bits move along the wires that are necessary. So anything that is critical for secure drop to work, it will let those those pass along the wire, otherwise it locks it down. So nothing can go in between where SecureDrop lives and the wider world. And then one last thing to note here, uh, you'll notice in the picture that coming out of the firewall is a picture of an onion. SecureDrop doesn't live on the normal internet necessarily. Um, there is an extra network, basically a whole network on top of the internet called the Tor network. And it provides uh, lots of, of different, really good, important properties. In this case, the two that are worth mentioning is that it provides anonymity and it provides encryption. So SecureDrop is only available on the Tor network, on the special network, and not just the internet itself. And so to access a SecureDrop, all a source needs to do is on their computer, there's a special piece of software called the Tor browser that lets them get online to that Tor network. And then they'll go to an organization's secure drop and upload a file or send a message, which we'll do here in just a few minutes so you know exactly what it's like. They can submit uh, pretty much anything. It can be just a message. It can be documents, photos, audio, video. As long as it's under 500 megabytes, they can send pretty much anything they want. And then the last part that I want to highlight from this diagram is the uh, really the journalist workflow. And you'll notice that it's, it's definitely the largest portion of this diagram. There are the most pieces to it. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, why that is. Um, but just to kind of walk through this workflow, uh, the journalist has a computer um, 
the computer is only used for talking to secure drops. So when it comes time for them to review the submissions they've received, they'll go onto this computer, they'll connect to the secure drop that's running on the other computer we talked about before. Uh, and from there, they'll go online and they'll download all of the submissions that they've received. Now, it's important to note that they can't actually see what is submitted on this computer yet. It doesn't have the key that is needed to unlock it and view it. So to do that, what they have to do is they put in an encrypted USB drive. They copy those downloads over, basically the submissions they pulled off of the server. And then you'll notice that in this diagram, there's a picture of a, a sneaker or a tennis shoe. Uh, that's sometimes referred to as a sneaker net. What they actually do is they, you know, well, they lace up their shoes and they take it to a totally separate computer. Uh, and this other computer is the one that is behind the air gap, meaning it is never connected to a network. So this other computer, uh, we call it the secure viewing station. That's where the submissions are actually decrypted, so unlocked and processed. Uh, they put in their encrypted USB drive, they copy the submissions over, they wipe the drive, and then uh, from there, they uh, you click to open it, you process it, and then however is appropriate for your newsroom, at that point you can export the files to another USB drive, print it out, uh, really however your newsroom prefers to handle that. And I know that this photo can be uh, a little intimidating to look at. There are lots of pieces moving together. I wanted to show you one other visual, uh, you know, kind of condense this and, and put it into a real world application. I want to note that what you're about to see is not uh, what we recommend in terms of physical security or, or, you know, how to store the equipment. But just to give you a sense of what it looks like, this is an entire secure drop setup. Um, so we have two computers here, the application server and the monitor server. Um, those are the two I was talking about before that actually serves SecureDrop. Uh, in this photo, they're just running on little tiny boxes that we recommend called Intel NUX. Uh, below that is the network firewall. It kind of looks like a router that you might have inside of your house. Uh, and then beside of it, we have two laptops, one where we've removed the wireless equipment uh, so it can't connect to a network, uh, and the other one, which is just a normal laptop that is used to connect to a secure drop and download those submissions. And real quick, before we move on to the demo portion of this uh, conversation, I wanted to talk about a few additional protections that secure drop provides. One is automated provisioning to guard against misconfigurations. So when it comes time for an administrator to set up secure drop, um, it's important that it be configured in a way that is secure as possible and doesn't differ from our recommendations. So um, there's just a kind of a, a minimum amount of work to get things uh, at a, a base level. And then from there, an administrator runs a couple commands that pulls in our software and it sets itself up essentially. Um, so we have scripts that do the installation for secure drop and make sure that everything that gets installed is according to our, our policies and, and really just meets the specifications to be as safe as possible. Uh, we also provide hardened custom OS kernels on those uh, the computers that run SecureDrop. Um, basically, what that means is that the software at the core of the system that SecureDrop runs on top of has extra patches applied just to give it that extra bit of security. Uh, it also has network hardening. Like I mentioned uh, a moment ago, there are minimal rules on the firewall so that only the absolute essential bits uh, can flow on the wire to and from the secure drop environment. Anything that's not needed for secure drop to work gets shut off and isn't allowed to go into that environment or out of. Uh, and last but not least, we've already touched on this, but access to secure drop only happens via the Tor network. Uh, so everything is uh, by that nature, it provides that layer of anonymity and encryption. All right, and with that, I'm going to temporarily stop presenting and I'm going to switch Let's see. I'm just going to switch to a different view here. There we go. Uh, and so what you're looking at now is what a source would see if they were to visit a secure drop. So in this scenario, a source has something they want to share. They've found a secure drop belonging to an organization they can trust. Uh, sometimes that can be found on an organization's contact page. We also, uh, at securedrop.org, we maintain a directory uh, where you can go and find ones that have passed uh, our base requirements uh, in terms of uh, security. So this is what a source would see when they open to a browser and load a secure drop 
page. Uh, so the very first thing you'll notice is here on the left, it will say first submission. Uh, it'll ask if it's your first time submitting to secure drop. If it is, that's where you want to start. And in this case, this is the first time we've ever submitted. So absolutely, let's get started. And the very first thing that the system does is it generates a random code name. Now, this code name is the only identifier that you have into the server. Um, their sources don't have any accounts on the server, uh, but sometimes it's necessary if you've submitted something and the organization wants a little bit more information from you or they want to communicate something to you. It's necessary for you to return and basically convince the server that you've been here before. So the only way to do that is to provide it your code name. So in this case, I'm going to uh, copy that over. Uh, let's see here. Uh, ideally, if you were a source, you would want to memorize this. Uh, but if, if you're not able to memorize it, you'll at least want to write it down somewhere that is secure, that you're the only person that would have access to it or, or would ever be able to find it. Uh, so once you have your code name recorded, securely. Uh, we're going to hit continue. It'll take just a moment. Uh, if we need a reminder, we can click the box that says show code name, and that will remind us what our code name is. Um, but what I'm interested in here is actually submitting something to a secure drop. Uh, I'm going to send just a message that says I have lots of good info. And immediately, uh, in this case, it's very quick. It says, success, thank you for sending information to us. Please check back later for replies. Uh, just because I have a little bit more that I want to share with them that I didn't do in the first message, I'm going to uh, attach a file here. In this case, uh, I just clicked choose file. Uh, you probably weren't able to see it because of the way I'm sharing, but uh, I just selected a file here. In this case, it's the Krabby Patty secret formula. And I'll send a message that says for Plankton. And there we go. The secure drop has received our file and message. Uh, there's one other section I'll highlight briefly, uh, which is red replies. Uh, if a journalist from the organization wants to get back in touch with me, they can do so and it will show up here. Uh, but they haven't reviewed it yet, so there's nothing to see. So because of that, I'm going to go ahead and click log out uh, and then step away from the computer. And what we'll look at now is what it's like for a journalist to interact with the system. Uh, so here we go. So as soon as a journalist logs into SecureDrop, this is what they see. They have a list of all the submissions. And I'm going to click Refresh here. And once I clicked Refresh, you'll notice that there was a new submission up the top from Longish Screener that happened, in this case, 48 seconds ago. Um, that was me <laughs> submitting uh, those secrets to the secure drop here. Uh, and you can see that there have been other submissions throughout the day. There were several two hours ago, five hours ago, 10 hours ago. Uh, the other thing that you might notice uh, if you were paying really close attention to the code names is that the code name that the journalist sees is different from the one that the source sees. Uh, and this is just a little bit of extra kind of obfuscation uh, so that in the event a journalist were compelled to give up information about a source, it wouldn't actually tie back to anything that the source has a record of. Uh, those names don't match up. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and click this one here, which I happen to know is the one I submitted. And so here in this journalist view, you can see that I have, in this case, three different things to download. Uh, I have a message that ends in uh, message.gpg. That .gpg tells me that this is the encrypted or scrambled version of the message. If I were to try to open it and look at it, it would just be absolute nonsense. It would be gibberish. Uh, and that's true of all of these. These are all encrypted. Uh, you'll also see down here doc.gz.gpg. So that is the document that I sent. Uh, in this case, it was the Krabby Patty secret formula. Uh, and again, this is something where as the journalist, I would download this uh, and take it to the, uh, put it on an encrypted USB drive and take it to the secure viewing station to actually look at. Uh, and we'll, we'll look at that here in just a minute. Uh, for now, I'm just gonna send a quick reply. Uh, thanks, I'll be in touch. All right, so the source will receive my reply the next time they log in. So real quick, let's see what that looks like. And to do that, I'm just going to go back to where I was as the source. 
So in this case, it's no longer my first submission. I am a return visitor. Uh, so I'm going to click login and I'm going to copy this code name uh, that I had from before. This is going to identify me to the system as being me. Otherwise it would have no clue who I am. It still really has no clue who I am. It just knows that this isn't the first time I've been here. Uh, and so now I can again submit files or messages, but I can also read replies. And in this case, I can see here I got something back from the journalist that says, thanks, I'll be in touch. And then it says that, uh, you know, for safety in the unlikely event someone learns my code name, please delete all replies. So I'm done. I'm going to hit delete. And there we go. If I wanted to send something back to the, to the journalist, I could just reply here and submit that message back. So that's essentially the entire workflow for uh, submitting to a secure job and as a journalist accessing the submissions and working with them. I'm gonna go back now and show you one more uh, piece that I wasn't able to show you. And the reason I wasn't able to show you this uh, in the live demo is because uh, to actually view those submissions, I would have to take it. If you remember the, the sneakers, I'd have to put it on that encrypted drive and take it uh, via sneaker net and walk it over to a secure viewing station that has the correct key on it uh, and handle it there. So I don't have a way of really showing that to you live, but I have a couple of screenshots here that will show you that process. Uh, over in the left uh, of that screen, you should see uh, there's a file that's on this transfer device. That's the encrypted USB drive. Uh, we copy it over to the secure viewing station. We wipe the drive and eject it. And then the last thing we do, uh, we basically click to open. And because that key is already on the secure viewing station, it unlocks and I can see the message. Uh, if there were files attached, I could look at the files. At this point, they're unscrambled, they're uh, decrypted, and I can process them however makes sense for my newsroom, whether that's putting it on another drive and then taking it to you know their Mac or Windows workstation that, that the journalist is working on, or printing it out or something else. So that's a, a kind of a look at what SecureDrop is and how it works. Uh, that's the full workflow. Uh, that's what a source would see uh, if they were submitting or a journalist would see when they're interacting with it. Um, so that's the current state of SecureDrop, but I wanna take a minute and talk a little bit about where we're heading. And so as you've probably already picked up on from that diagram and just watching me kind of interact with it, uh, the journalist experience has some opportunities for improvement. Um, one thing you'll notice is that it required multiple computers uh, to be able to look at a submission. Uh, and in that same uh, kind of field, you have to be physically located near your secure viewing station. Um, so you're always kind of tethered to that computer and they always have to be together. Uh, you also have to juggle multiple encrypted USB drives. Sometimes it can be a little confusing. You know, is this the, the one that I put the encrypted files on? Is this the one with the decrypted files? Uh, we always recommend labeling them and, and being very careful with them, but uh, you do have to juggle multiple encrypted USB drives. And, you know, bottom line, uh, it's time consuming. It takes a long time to download files, uh, download those submissions from the server, copy them to a USB drive, walk them over to the secure viewing station, uh, and then decrypt them. Uh, and if this were a TV infomercial, this is where they would say, but there has to be a better way. And of course there is. So that leads me to uh, my next point. Uh, this is a quote from a blog post that we put out a few weeks ago. And it says, in 2024, the SecureDrop workstation will become the preferred fully supported way for journalists to connect to SecureDrop to interact with sources. And you might be thinking, well, what in the world is the SecureDrop workstation? SecureDrop Workstation is a unified workstation built on another special operating system called Cubes, and it uses multiple virtual machines uh, and policies to preserve the air gap. Basically, you have one computer that's running a bunch of smaller computers, and they talk to each other in special ways that makes it kind of emulate that air gap. Uh, what that means is that there is a client application that lets journalists view submissions similar to email, and I'll show you a screenshot here. Uh, in just a couple slides, but what you really see as a journalist would be uh, a list of submissions that look kind of like emails. And then when you click on them, uh, you instantly get to read the messages. Uh, and with just another click, you can open attachments in a safe environment uh, that is still air gapped. 
And to, to kind of illustrate this or, or to draw a comparison, this is the slide that we saw just a few minutes ago. Uh, this is the current infrastructure or the current workstation or the current secure drop environment. And uh, it's important to note that the, the experience for the source remains the same. Uh, and the, the computers or the servers that actually host secure drop and the firewall, that all stays the same. What changes is the journalist experience. So you'll see here uh, with this new diagram, uh, and I'll jump back and forth again just to kind of illustrate the big change. Uh, with this new infrastructure, you only have one laptop on the journalist side. That laptop kind of does everything. It lets you connect to your secure drop server. It lets you process those submissions. You view it on that laptop uh, and you process it, whether that's exporting it to a USB drive or printing it out. Uh, everything is handled on that one uh, single workstation computer. And so it looks kind of like this for journalists. Uh, they click an icon, it opens this client application, and now instead of having to do like we did, uh, you know, go to all the submissions, download the files, copy them over, here you just go through each submission, it loads the messages in that view. If you have an attachment, you click it, uh, and it opens it in that safe environment. So. Uh, just based on uh, on our kind of uh, anecdotal testing that we've seen so far, uh, it decreases the amount of time uh, by an order of magnitude, uh, the, the amount of time that it takes for journalists to process these submissions. All right, and with that, we come to the question section. So I'm going to uh, stop screen sharing and I'm happy to answer any questions that I can. And also Kevin is here uh, to also answer questions. I know the um, directory lists uh, 32 news organizations, um, which is something that I like to hang my hat on and, and boast about. It's it's both a frustration and a boast that we do not know the stories that break uh, for Secure Drop. Um, as a fundraiser, I would I would love to know, um, but knowing that it's out there, that people are using it, that the the directory has a bunch of names that I recognize and some that I don't. Um, is there a effort to facilitate more? Um, what does the, the support look like for the current orgs that are using it? Can you just talk a little bit about those folks that are in that directory? Absolutely. So anyone that installs Secure Drop is uh, potentially eligible for the directory. Uh, we have a form that they can fill out, uh, and there are just a set of requirements. Uh, we post those in our documentation. Uh, and basically, we do a review. Um, so we review the, the contact page. We call it the landing page that you have where you list the, the uh, addresses for your secure drop. We go through and inspect that. Once you meet our uh, qualifications from a security standpoint, basically no trackers uh, having all the right security headers applied, um, once they meet those requirements, we're happy to list your secure drop in our directory. Um, and at that point, we also give out something called a short onion name. So um, one thing I didn't talk about is secure drops have kind of a, a long kind of random address to get to it. Um, we're able to provide shorter kind of customized names for organizations that meet those requirements. Um, so that's one big benefit of being in the directory. Uh, in terms of support, anyone can request uh, a support account with us. Uh, we do have priority support options for organizations that need help with guided installations or you know quicker response time um, or really extra training, things like that. We do have priority support, but anyone is welcome to register for a support account uh, and we provide help, uh, whether it's questions in, um, you know, what kind of hardware do you need for a secure drop? Um, you know, am I, is secure drop even right for my organization? We, we're happy to answer all those questions. Thanks. Um, I have spent some time in operations with Freedom of the Press Foundation, and I did participate in getting some of this hardware in the past for some of these uh, news organizations. I don't recall it being uh, prohibitively expensive in the, the old version with all the hardware and the stuff like that. Um, is that true, first of all? And secondly, is the, the goals for the future, the new system, does that cut costs at all uh, for, for the user? Very good questions. Um, so Secure Drop was always kind of designed around the idea of being able to run it on equipment that you might already have, uh, or even just low cost equipment. So um, the servers that it runs on, um, can be acquired relatively inexpensively. The NUCs we recommend are usually around $500 a piece. Um, that price varies. Um, in terms of the laptops that are needed, we have been known to recommend like used ThinkPads, things like that. So it's not 
uh, prohibitively expensive to run a secure drop by any means. Um, in terms of the new uh, secure drop workstation, uh, really the big change there is that your computer, uh, the computer that you use to access secure drop needs to have a bit more memory. Uh, cubes, because it runs on virtual machines, needs a little extra memory um, to be able to run. So uh, the benefit of that is you only need one laptop. So you're cutting out the cost of two laptops. Um, the trade-off there is that the laptop you do have, you might need to put a little bit more memory into it. I've always been intrigued by the air gap concept, the, the sneaker net, as you call it. Um, virtual machines it's a similar concept, right? It's just in the virtual world. Um, could you explain it? Explain that like I'm five for it for us. <laughs> Definitely. And Kev, if you want to chime in uh, as well on the, the virtual machine question, you might be better suited at that than I am. Um, but essentially, uh, you have a computer uh, that is running, uh, in this case, cubes being an operating system that is designed around virtual machines. Um, and you have to have hardware that allows you to have virtual machines. Most uh, processors from the past 10 years or so will do it. Um, but really, it's just a computer running on a, or a computer running on a computer. You have a piece of software uh, and you have your, your operating system and then you have other operating systems running kind of like as an application on the computer itself. Um, so that would be my explanation of it. But Kevin, do you have a, a differing explanation of it? No, I think that's very succinct and, and, and very accurate. Um, ironically enough, I'm actually dropping off the call repeatedly because I actually use uh, Cubes as my own machine, and right now it's misbehaving. Um, but yeah, I think that's a very good description of that, basically how we use the um, or basically how we use Cubes. Um, one thing as well to note is that we actually this is basically work that's already or that has already been you know or basically Cubes is an operating system that's already been kind of developed for, with security minded things in, in or security minded kind of applications you know in mind. And it uses a system called, or a background hypervisor called Zen, which basically provides all of the kind of features in terms of like isolating those virtual machines and you know basically managing communications between them in a very secure way. So we very much kind of get to piggyback off the an awful lot of the great work that those teams are doing when we're building the system. Definitely, I appreciate you highlighting that, Kevin. I'm not seeing any other questions in the queue. Um... That was very comprehensive. Thank you very much, Nathan, for that explanation. Um, as a fundraiser, I appreciate the amounts you listed for the NUC units, $500, that type of thing. That helps me wrap my head around what is a very complex program of like, how can we support this, right? A, a donation, five donations of a hundred bucks or something can, can get these uh, newsrooms set up with this very important tool. With that, um, thank you all for joining us. Secure Drop 101 uh, will be available in the events archive. I'll get it uh, edited and put up there in the next couple of days, and I'll email you all to let you know that it's available. You can email me um, at membership at freedom.press if you have any questions about Secure Drop or any of our other work. Nathan, Kevin, thank you both so much for being here. Thank you.